Well, hey everyone, welcome to episode 308 of S-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week, I had the pleasure of speaking with Canadian photographer, Shane Turjan. Shane and I connected on Twitter of all places, where he told me all about the Light Chasers conference that he's been organizing, which immediately piqued my interest to say the least. Shane also submitted some incredible images into the Natural Landscape Photography Awards over the past two years, and he's made it into our perennial photography fine art book both times. I think you will enjoy our chat this week, so stay tuned. Before we dive in, I want to mention that this week's episode is brought to you by Nature Photographers Network. NPN is a great community of like-minded people that are super generous with their time in helping each other improve their photography. There is an incredibly helpful critique forum for multiple genres of nature photography, including wildlife photography and landscape photography. There is also lots of full-time professionals offering critique, and it's a wonderful place to engage with other photographers. If you are looking to improve your photography while participating in a community with great people, I think it's the place for you. For just $49 per year, you can join the community on NPN and gain access to some other amazing benefits, including fantastic articles, webinars, discounted tutorials, software, books, and a lot more. It's such a great place and we'd love to see you there. Just head over to npn.link forward slash fstop to join. Use the code fstop10 for a 10% discount. That's npn.link forward slash fstop. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Shane Turjan. Shane Turjan, it's great to have you on the podcast. It's great to be here, man. It's, a, it's actually a huge honor to be a part of this, so thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, man. I, you know, I'm always a big fan of other people with massive tattoos, so that's <laughs> exciting right there, right? Yeah, it's, uh, we, we're, we kind of break the old white man mold of, uh, of photography and, and get it a little yeah. more hip. <laughs> <laughs> right, or just a little bit, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so you've got a, you've got a photograph in the Natural Landscape Photography Awards book that's coming out soon, which is super cool. Yeah, and, and one in volume one as well. Yeah, it's awesome. And, uh, you know, like, I don't even remember, I think, I think I posted like an Instagram story and you replied to it and I was like, oh, this guy sounds super interesting. Let's, let's have a conversation. So it was, it was on Twitter, which is even more interesting because <laughs> nothing good ever comes from Twitter. So the fact that we can connect this way via that, I think is, is pretty good. So, you know, there are, there are still some good things that can happen with social media. Right. Exactly. It's just all how you use it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, for people that aren't familiar with you and your photography, would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, my name is Shane Turjan. I'm 45. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, I'm a nature photographer generalist, I like to, to say, because I, I pretty much cover all uh, nature genres. Um, I'm, I've also been referred to as a multidiscipline entrepreneur. Uh, because I have my hands in a lot of things. And a friend of mine introduced me that way, and I'm like, I like that. I'm going to steal that. That multidiscipline sounds really fancy. Um, right. So I own a tattoo shop called Shades of Grey here in town. Uh, I'm a toy and comic book dealer. I've been dealing and collecting toys and comic books for over 30 years. Um, I uh, also put on toy and comic book shows. I've been doing that for 20 years. We actually have our 20th anniversary show of one of our events uh, coming up next month. Um, I teach Japanese jujitsu. I've written a couple of books. I've, uh, and, and, I, and I do photography. So I've got my hands in a few things and I like to keep myself busy, I guess. And you sleep never? I actually sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where, you know, finally you start to figure out how to do it well and you can manage your time a lot better. So, Right. And uh, single, married, kids, no kids? Uh, I have a girlfriend uh, who I've been with for a year. I've been married before and that was, you know, that's that's long done and we'll just continue life as it, as it goes. Okay. All right on. Wow, man. Well, I mean, there's so many things that you just threw at me. I'm not even <laughs> sure where we can start. Um, but maybe we can start on a, um, a very personal side of things. Um, sure. 
I would love for you to just tell the story about how you discovered your passion for photography. Yeah, um, <clears throat> my passion for, for photography actually came from a very prolonged and severe depression. Um, you know, it, it was one of those things where life was just kind of building up. Um, and my life, you know, was, was pretty big for a while because I had written books and, and almost had my own television show and was, was fairly well known in the, in particularly in the Star Wars world. Hmm. And, um, the one thing about the more notoriety you gain and the higher the pedestal you start to put yourself on is when that pedestal gets yanked out from underneath of you, you fall that much further and harder. Hmm. Um, and you know, I, I ended up quitting my career of 10 years to open my shop. A month after I did that, I got divorced and, you know, things actually got worse after that, just, you know, without getting into the dirty laundry of all of it. Um, I ended up in a really bad place and I actually ended up having a nervous breakdown, which is hard to even say, you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, that that's, that's what happened to me, but I had a complete and total nervous breakdown. You mm -hmm. like to think you're indestructible until all of a sudden you're not. Right. And, you know, I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I lost a ton of weight. When I did sleep, I'd quite often wake up and just have, like have to throw up right away just from the depression and the anxiety and the weight of everything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I often say when I, I, I give talks about this all the time, and I often say that, like, I, I didn't want to die but I didn't want to live anymore either. And there, right. I think there's a distinction between like being fully suicidal and just to the point where you just don't have anything that you can feel that you live for anymore. And, and that's the point that I had gotten to. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for my dogs, um, you know, I, I don't know if I would have made it out, but you know, your, my dogs became the reason that I had to get up and get out of bed every morning. And I'm very lucky that here in Edmonton, there's a, some, we have one of the biggest trail systems uh, along our river valley in uh, anywhere in North America. And I'm very lucky that I live very close to, to those. And, you know, I just get up every morning and I, I take them out. And, you know, when I was out there, I just started to find myself noticing the, the small things that we always miss in life you know, the, the dew on the grass or the frost and the leaves or, you know, the, just the sunset. Um, I started longing being under the stars again, which was always something that re reset me. Um, and with the exception of the stars, I just started taking pictures of those things with my iPhone 4 and right. was really enjoying doing that. And so I had worked in television for a long time. And so I had a background and understanding of framing and composition and, and all those kinds of things. And, you know, I just started posting, you know, Instagram was pretty new at the time and I had created an Instagram account for sharing various aspects of my life. And I started sharing more and more of these nature photos and people were like, man, these are beautiful. They're really, you know, you're really good at this. You should, you know, maybe think about doing it more. And uh, a, a really good friend of mine who's a uh, pinup photographer um, in California, his name's Don Raskin. He just said to me, he's like, imagine what you could do with a real camera. And I, I kind of took that as a challenge. Like, yeah, imagine what I could do with a real camera because I can't <laughs> take pictures of stars with my iPhone 4. And that was one thing that I really wanted to do was take pictures of the night sky. And uh, so I had actually recently cashed in on some of my collectibles investments and had a good chunk of money. And another really good friend of mine here, um, Curtis Como, he's one of the most successful advertising and, and commercial photographers in Western Canada. He's like, okay, are you serious about this? This is something that you want to do. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, then just buy what I tell you to buy. And <laughs> he, he's all of a sudden I went from an iPhone four to a one DX Canon one DX <laughs> had no idea how to use it. Of course, right. because it's a pretty steep learning curve. And I uh, proceeded to teach myself photography uh, with night photography. So I did it super backwards compared to lots of people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of people find night sky photography really intimidating. And that's where I just jumped in and started. Right. Um, and after I learned that, then I kind of had to dial it back a little bit and be like, oh, I don't shoot all my landscapes at 2.8. And right. know, <laughs> all of these things that come to you with experience as, as, things go, as time goes on. And, um, yeah, you know, and I just found myself desiring to be in nature more and more and more with photography being the excuse because, you know, I was not too bad at it when I started and just 
I was so became so passionate about it that it became my reason for for healing and getting healthy and you know finding something to live for again. Hmm. Wow, man, that's 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 incredible. I'm first of all, I'm super happy that you found photography because um, I'm glad you're here and making incredible f photographs like you are. And I I feel like. The night photography thing is super interesting because um, I got super deep into night photography really early on in my photography adventures. And I feel like it's an awesome way to learn because if you can use your camera in the dark <laughs> and you can understand the exposure triangle in the dark, yeah, you're probably going to figure it out for everything else pretty easily. <laughs> Absolutely. It just becomes this this um, this way to intimately know your, your gear, right? Because you right. have to figure it out in... You know, and, and I think I actually, I, I did start with my night photography in the winter and here where I live, winter is not fun. Um, so <laughs> yeah. some of those nights were like, you know, minus 20, I'm going out to try to shoot and learn how to do all this sort of stuff. Cause I'm not one to sit in my house and chest out my gear. No, 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 no. Why would I do that when I could just, you know, throw myself out into the, into the wolves in the, in the outside and figure it out that way. That's funny. I remember when I got my first full frame camera. It was a Nikon D800, and I got the 14 to 24 f2.8. And I think three days later, I went to the Great Sand Dunes, and it was in January, and it was negative 20, like you, like you. And it was I was out there to photograph a uh, meteor shower, but yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun. Like this this year, I've I actually I've I've had uh, a foot surgery in November, so I've been laid up for eight weeks. And, oh, uh, I am not acclimated to the weather this year. So like, cause I've just been stuck inside for two months. So like yeah. that cold is, is not good. Um, yeah. what was it about night photography that you, you know, that drew you to that? Um, oh man, you know, like when I was a kid going camping, my, my dad got me super into stargazing. Um, and you know, I, 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 I could recognize some of the constellations and, you know, find the North star and, like I, I had a really strong fascination and foundation in the night sky. And then one time I decided to point my camera at it, you know, and I was like, holy cow, you can actually see some stuff. And so that, it just, it hooks you, you know, you know how it is. Yeah, it really does. I mean, that was very similar to me. Like I grew up in the middle of nowhere uh, at the end of a dirt road in Saskatchewan <laughs> and the, the stars were it, you know, and you know, long drives to town with my head pressed to the glass of the window of the vehicle and watching the aurora, you know, over the snow fields and stuff like that. And as a teenager, after we moved up here, I just go out to the park outside my parents' house and I just lay out in, in the park and just look up at the sky. And my parents would buy me astronomy books. So like you, I had sort of a foundation in the night sky and understood right. it. And uh, which made it really a lot easier to, to sort of get into it. But there's there's something about being under the night sky that just sort of, you know, puts it all in perspective and resets you. And it's super calming. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 totally. Well, so you've pretty much said that nature photography has saved your life. Um, clearly, being out in nature has had a profound impact on your mental health and your well-being. Um what do you suspect are the keys for leveraging that benefit if others are experiencing the same challenges? I really think it comes down to making the time. Um, we get so overwhelmed in our, in our busy lives that we don't make time for ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer that we're not supposed to live the way that society has forced us into these boxes to live, you know, working nine to five, you know, two kids and, and, uh, two weeks vacation a year and just like you know it, it's this terrible way to live um and and we're not designed for that we're designed to be connected to nature and we're designed to you know be creative and explore things that are inside of us but we've been so conditioned to be these wheels in this capitalist clog where we just have to like you know just make enough money just to survive and get by um that we're we're kind of killing our souls in the process and it's just it's not good for us at all so you know I, I really encourage people to find the time to just get out in nature um one of the things you know that that i find really interesting the more I, the deeper i've gotten to this and like i said I, I give a talk on on nature photography and mental health is the actual scientific benefits of being in nature 
um, to the point where there's a group of doctors in Canada who prescribe nature pills where you right. you have to go out and spend, you know, 20 to 30 minutes in nature a day in order to, you know, reduce the, the cortisone and bring up other levels of things in, in our body. And, and nature does that just automatically, you know, it just it, right. because we are of nature and we forget that living in big cities and, and, you know, in this grind and this hustle that we forget that we are of nature and nature is of us. Um, there's a really great quote from uh, Cheryl Strayed, the writer, she wrote uh, Wild and, and, and other things, but it's, um, uh, there's a sunrise and a sunset and you can choose to, to be there for it. You can put yourself in the way of beauty. And sometimes, it, you know, that's it. It only maybe just like, hey, I guess got to duck out for five minutes and go watch the sunset and just let that kind of bring it into us and relax us. And, and these days we're so lucky, like photography can be done with this. Yeah. That's yeah, how yeah, I started. Phone. Yeah. You know, we can take really compelling and really beautiful photos with our phones. And I mean, this is a, I just got the 14. That's a, it's come a long way from the iPhone 4 when I started. Right. And, you know, I encourage people just to just to try to connect with with that creative outlet within themselves. They don't need to go buy, you know, all the fanciest camera gear. If you think it's something that you might be interested in, just get into the habit of, of finding enjoyment in taking photos of things that interest you. Yeah, no, that, that, and I think it comes through in people's photography when when they've when they've connected in that way with nature. I mean, I feel like there's some photographers work where you look at it and it doesn't quite have that that same i don't know how to describe it but um the, the there's no soul to it there's no substance that that's driven by that passion for being outside and being in nature and um i think it shines through i, I agree with you 100 percent. you know one of the things for me is like i find that there's a a big lack of, of authenticity in nature photography now. And whether that's, you know, just because of the social media culture or the influencer culture, or, you know, just trying to build names for ourselves and all this sort of stuff, you know, right. when people go out and they just take the same photos that other people have taken, or they slap the same filter on, you know, everything. And like that Insta repeat account, it really sort of- It's the best. It's it just, it shows you how uncreative people are being in order to just fulfill some sort of perceived uh, idea of creativity or uh, influence or whatever else. And it, it's it, it's lacking. All of that stuff just lacks, like you said, like a soul or, 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 or things. And it's one of the things that I love so much about what you guys created with the with the Natural Landscape Photography Awards is it it goes back in it to, to honor those photos that you can tell that there's there's soul and feeling behind. Mm, yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, I'm in a Discord channel with a bunch of other landscape and nature photographers, and you know, for I'm not say I'm not going to say it's bad because I love thinking about business and social media myself. I think it's it's just really fun to think about. But I also feel like there's a lot of people who get into photography and then they jump straight into trying to figure out how they can make it their career or how they can monetize it or, you know, they're, they're so focused on marketing and business and self-promotion that I feel like the, the photographs haven't quite caught up to that yet. And it's, um, I, 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 I wish that people would spend more time interjecting that level of energy into their love of nature and being outside and making images first, because I think some of that stuff will eventually follow if you, you know, if you stay at it for long enough, I think there's a impatience to a lot of people too. Yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And one of the things for me, like when I got into photography and I did start, you know, noticing that, you know, I was getting a, a lot of followers or people were, you know, telling me that my photos were really good and, and so on and so forth, is that I didn't want to do that it, <laughs> because I had taken all of my passions previously and turned them into businesses. You know, I, I just, you know, I used to love, you know, tattoos and hanging out in tattoo shops. And then I turned that into a business. <laughs> I, I love toys and comic books, but I turned that into a business. And when you do that, it, it can, it, you run the risk of, of taking your passion for it away. Um, because now it becomes about paying the bills. 
And I never wanted to do that with photography. I wanted to make sure that like photography for me was still coming from, you know, that place where I discovered it. And it wasn't about making money and becoming, you know, gaining a name because I had gained a name and all these other things that I wasn't setting out to do that in photography at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a, I think there's a distinct difference in, and, and it, it, it applies to all things um, in people who just that happens organically and the people who are trying desperately and so hard to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, we see it now, particularly like with the NFT stuff, where the, the lengths of uh, that people will go to of like kind of really greasy and um, sort of selling themselves out completely just to like try to sell a JPEG on Twitter. There's almost a formula that you can follow with people the way that they do that. Um, and, I, and I think that as professionals, we have to, um, there, there's a really fine line be, 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 between being a passionate photographer or a passionate educator and, you know, constantly shilling yourself. Right. And, you know, by, if we're always just constantly shilling, you kind of run the risk of turning people off and making it seem that you're not as passionate as maybe you are or you would like to be or you should be. Right. I'm, a, I'm always curious what other people think about that particular dilemma, because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of facing that challenge myself, thinking about transitioning into full time. And, and that's one of my biggest fears is that I don't want my passion for the craft and for the, what excites me about being in nature as a photographer to be to diminish. I don't think it will. I mean, I've had enough experiences now where I've been teaching a workshop where I'm still very excited and, you know, I'm, I'm just having a wonderful time and things like that. But I'm, I'm wondering if what you think is kind of the formula for trying to, to do them at the same time in terms of running a business while not losing your passion for the thing you got into for the, be why you got into it to begin with. I think if there was a, an easy answer to that question, we'd all have it like, you know, there'd be, there'd be so much less stress for, Come for on, all Shane. of us. Um, I, wish I, I wish I had that magic answer. For me, um, and part of the reason why I, I have so many businesses, I think, is um, because mm -hmm. not all of them have become my primary driver. Um, there's a really amazing photographer uh, in Canada named Dave Broshaw, and we were talking one day and the, the concept of um, many streams make a river is sort of my income approach, uh, my philosophy on income. And it's like, if I can make a little bit of money from this thing that I love, and I can make a little bit of money from this and a little bit from this and a little bit from this, all of a sudden I've got a raging river of of income without me being like, I've got to give everything to photography or I've got to give everything to the tattoo shop or I've got to give everything to toys and comic books. You know, I can, I can pick and choose and go from there. So like I, 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 one of the things that I learned in business was that putting all of your eggs in one basket isn't necessarily a good idea. Right. Um, you've, you've kind of got to have a couple of other things on the go, even if they're not you know, even if it's 10% of your energy or 20% of your energy, at least you still have something that you can generate a little bit of extra side income from and, and side hustles and stuff like that. Um, because if you, if you just decide to go whole hog 100% into something and it doesn't work out or, you know, the stress that comes of it makes you start to hate it, that's a, that's a big, a, a big problem, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important to have even if it's, you know, just a little side hustle or a little income, if you can, if I don't, you know, I don't know what you do in your day job, but if you can freelance that a little bit to kind of stay connected and things be, you know, right. while you're building it up. And after a couple of years, you're like, no, I still love this. I'm, I'm into photography. It's all working. It's good. Then boom, you know, and that's probably what you've been doing. It um, is. <laughs> yeah. So if you're yeah. there, then I think you're probably, you're set. You know, yeah. I, I just, like you said, there's so many people who just like, jump right in and they're like, I'm going to be a full-time pro. And oh man, that's, that's a hard road, especially with nature photography. I mean, yeah, I'm mean, not shooting weddings on the side. <laughs> yeah. I definitely feel like making it in nature and landscape is all about that streams, making a river concept. Um, otherwise you do risk putting all your eggs in one basket and 
then a pandemic happens and you can't sell any workshops. So totally, you know, you, know, you never, things. you never know what's <laughs> going to come down the road. Right. And, and I've got some friends who are like incredibly well known and like highly regarded photographers here in Canada who went pro and who are having a really hard time and are really struggling making ends meet, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not easy. No. And, and it, and it, and it's exhausting constantly having to put yourself out there. Right. Yeah. I remember I had, um, Richard Burnaby on the podcast and I was actually, we were roommates in Antarctica back in December. And I remember, I'll never forget what he said when I asked him, like, what advice do you have for people who want to go full, full-time pro? And he was like, it, don't do it unless you're willing to sacrifice everything except for your friends and your family. Yep. And I think that's true. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. yeah. And even in the process, you probably will lose friends and you'll probably irritate family in the same. That's oh, for sure. <laughs> right? like... <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, going back to kind of your journey and, you know, the mental health challenges that you faced, I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about, um, for you, how nature and nature photography helps you reconnect to your childlike curiosities. Yeah. So for me, curiosity is like a big part of it. When we were kids, we're fascinated by everything. Like right. everything is incredible. And, you know, especially when we're outside, it's outside is a very exciting world. And, you know, as we get older and we, you know, especially we get into those teenage years where we were grumpy and miserable about everything. Uh, and then we go move right into adulthood where, man, now we just got to make, you know, get a job and make a living and career or college and all this stuff. We're stripped of that curiosity and we're stripped of that imagination that, you know, we have as when we're kids. And, and I think it's really important that, you know, we, we stay connected to that somehow because it, it, it just, it, it keeps life fresh and interesting. Again, you know, I was talking earlier about just being ground underneath that, the wheel of life. And if we have something that we're naturally curious about and want to keep learning about, doesn't matter if that's photography or not for me, it is, but you know, if we have that to keep us, you know, engaged in something other than the grind, you know, we're going to be happier, I think. I agree. And I, I might, I might even go as far as to say that if you're a very curious person as a photographer, you're going to make better photographs. I agree a hundred percent. Um, you know, I find that, um, with, with photography, there's so much to learn, right? And and that's what I what I love so much about it, is it we're, we're it's not just learning about the camera, it's not just learning about the gear and how it works and, and and all of the things to learn about photography, of which there is an ample amount to learn. But the in order to be better at photographing the subjects that we choose to photograph, we have to learn about those subjects. If we want to be a better wildlife photographer, we have to learn about wildlife biology and behavior and all these sort of things. If we want to be a better storm photographer, we have to learn about weather. If we want to be a better night sky photographer, we have to learn about the night sky. So right. whatever whatever facet that we you know choose to pursue, it's a continual process of learning. And, and that's so good even just for our mental health, because when we're learning new things, we're forming, we're firing our brain in different ways, we're creating new neural pathways. And, and when we're doing that, we're, you know, we're, we're fighting the habits of depression and anxiety and all these different things, because we're constantly being engaged, we're constantly learning, we're constantly, you know, bringing new information into our, into our brain to like process and, and be passionate about and be excited about. And that all comes from that curiosity, you know, like you can watch a three-year-old to be like, Ooh, an ant. And they'll sit there and they'll watch that ant for like four hours. And like, as an adult now, like after I've sort of reconnected to nature through photography, I can be like, Oh, an ant. And I'll sit there and I'll watch the ants for like half an hour and be totally into it and totally enthralled. Right. And like, man, that's, if we could all just tap back into that aspect of ourselves, you know, I, I think we, we may end up being a lot happier. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm curious, um, in what other ways do you feel like curiosity plays a role? in maintaining your personal happiness? I think that's a lot of it. Um, 
you know, I, I'm somebody who's made a living off of, you know, nostalgic connection to our youth in terms of, you know, toys and comic books and Star and Wars, that's, right? Star Wars. <laughs> um, and, and just staying, you know, uh, we get told that we like at, at like 12, 13 years old, you got to move past those things. Those are those are kids things. You got to be a grown up and do grown up stuff. Why? Why? I'm 45 years old. I still ride a skateboard and, and read comic books every night before I go to bed. And it, it, it just it keeps you youthful and it keeps you young. And I think any way that we can find that keeps us young and keeps us learning and keeps us engaged in, in that sort of childlike imagination and curiosity, anything that we can do is, is just going to benefit our happiness. <clears throat> I love it. No, I totally agree. Um, I feel like curiosity is just an amazing thing in terms of ke keeping you happy, but also I feel like the more curious you are about things, the more you start to learn. And I think the more you start to learn, the more interesting you become as a person, which then I think can translate into images. I can't remember whose quote it was off the top of my head. I'm sure someone will yell at me, but I think there's a quote that's like, if you want to make more interesting photos, become a more interesting person. I read that in Guy Tao's book. I don't know if that was his quote, but it was definitely from... Yeah, I yeah, exactly. It's in one of his books for sure. Maybe More Than a Rock, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I, it, I do think it's someone else's quote, but... I think it okay. is. But I agree with it 100%. You know, like so many people are just, are, you know, are dull. And, and I don't want to be around dull people. I want to be around other people who are like engaged and, and learning and want to, you know just have fun and adventure and experience all these different things as opposed to be like, oh, I like one thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I'm the same way. Like I, it's, I'm so easily distracted when I'm in, especially when I'm in, in the field as a photographer, it used to be the other way around. I remember, you know, I'd go on hikes with a camera and I had like one photograph in mind and I didn't even pay attention to any other opportunities. And those photos usually weren't that interesting you know and so like i feel like the more curious you can be it's just going to translate yeah i agree i was at a um uh i did a workshop with my friend mark jinx up in the northwest territories in august um just outside Yellowknife, and we spent a few days exploring ourselves and we went to this really cool waterfall and it was beautiful and i was like man i'm stoked on this waterfall but man i'm really stoked on the way the light's hitting the water right now and the <laughs> from the part of this pond over here and right. i'm really i'm really stoked on the way this stream is running through this particular part of all these rocks on this side and this tree the way it's growing in this you know yes. and, and i didn't even look at the giant beautiful waterfall until like oh the light's kind of kicking off i should probably go take a couple shots of that but i, I kind of want to get back to this cool sport. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> no i'm the same way Hey man, it's it's good to hear because I I I I I mean I don't know about you, but like even if you come home with nothing, uh, like on that day, if you came home with nothing, you still had a great time, you know. Totally, you know, and so we were we were at uh, Blatchford Lake Lodge, which is a remote fly-in lodge, and we were there to to teach a, a Northern Lakes uh, workshop, and we got skunked with cloud the whole time we were there. So yeah. you know what do you do and you know we just took some of the participants out one day and we did an uh the and was, you know it's fall up there and there was like amazing tiny mushrooms like this big everywhere so we did a, an iphone macro iphone workshop walk one day it's awesome yeah. and and like three hours later we're just like oh my this is so fun and we just had the best time with these tiny mushrooms and we didn't even get the aurora and nobody cared you know right that's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so along those same lines, I'm curious what your strategies are for staying happy as a photographer in a world that seems designed to keep us unhappy. You know, the pressures of social media, the pressures of staying relevant, the pressures of going pro and so on. Hard one. And, I, you know, I'll admit right now, I'm, I, th I think I'm struggling more with that than I probably have in a, in a long time. I don't know what it is lately. Maybe it's because I was laid up for the last, you know, eight weeks and all I had was social media. Oh, yes. And I was just like, oh, I'll do it. This is, it was just too much. But it, you know, it, it just, it, I feel like we're, we're drowning in a sea of mediocrity with everything. And, and people equate someone being good at social media with being good at their craft. 
and they're entirely different things. Like you can be really good at social media and be a terrible photographer, but people think you're an amazing photographer because you're good at social media. And it, you know, it just, I, I just feel like we're, we're kind of, you know, diluting the pool with all of this stuff and it, and it's, and it's hard to stay happy through it. it you know, you're like, Oh man, that guy got that on that. And that, for that. Oh my God. I'm so glad you said it. <laughs> it's so painful for me. And I don't know if it's the way I'm wired or what, but like, I, I get an overwhelming sense of injustice when that happens. Like, <laughs> I know. and it happens pretty much anytime I open social media, especially not so much on Instagram because I'm very, careful about how, who I follow and everything. And like, whenever it's like, here's a suggested post, I'm like snooze for 30 days. I don't want to see same, any same. of that, but like on Twitter, you know, you see a lot of like suggested posts that come across that way. Like so-and-so liked this or commented on it or something. And then you see that it's like, it's like four really, really, really badly processed photos. And it has like 70,000 views and like, <laughs> 80 retweets or something and you're just like what the hell <laughs> yeah yeah so I've, I've i've lately one of the things that i've been saying is that like and it's not just photography it's it's creative things in general but it, it feels like social media has forced us to become like we're all pro wrestlers like we all have to have a gimmick we all are trying to like be the best and 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 hold the world title and put ourselves over and be the best you know to the fans but, you know, all we end up is, like, with these really terrible, like, WWF early 90s gimmicks that, like, nobody wants to remember, like, Bastion Booger or, you know, like, <laughs> Doink the Clown. Like, this is this is the kind of gimmicks that people are coming up with now to, like, try to put themselves out there. Like, flipping your image around this way and stretching the mountains this tall doesn't make you creative. I'm sorry to say it. It, it might get you a bunch of likes on Twitter, but we're, you know... And again, this is, might sound rude, and I apologize to people who like this band, but are you wanting to make images for people who listen to Nickelback? Or are you wanting to make images for people who listen to, like, you know, <clears throat> cool music that nobody's ever heard of before? And there's, there's that mainstream audience, which, you know, you're going to get the low-hanging fruit with, you, you can just go to Banff and you can take that shot all day long on your phone even, and, and that's fine. But it's, it's getting you know, deeper and, and trying, trying to create art and, and exposing yourself to ways of seeing and thinking that you wouldn't normally necessarily see and think to, you know, tr to create beautiful images, whether that's small scenes or intimate scenes or just looking at the landscape differently or putting yourself in different places, right? Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I sometimes come off as a bit, <laughs> maybe a bit too in intense with some of my opinions on things. Oh, no, um, I feel like we will get along perfect in real life Shane <laughs> um but like I, I you know I don't care if the mainstream doesn't like my images I'm not making my images for the mainstream I don't care if anybody likes my images like even in the last round of of the national the, of your guys's awards like you know one of my images made it to the book and made it super far but a couple of them only got like one <laughs> like like yeah like, yeah bang, they bombed and I'm like these were some of my favorite images that I saw. right it always hurts I know but I don't care you know what I mean like it's I mean, sure, it hurts a little bit, but it's like, I, I love that image, and that's all that matters to me. And and I yeah, think, yeah. you know, if we can cultivate not just our social media, like who we follow and how we follow people, um, but just who we interact with, who we engage with, um, and, and just kind of take it for what it is and look at these things for the positives that they can give us. Like, again, like we said when we started this, if it wasn't for Twitter, this wouldn't be happening. And, and that's a great thing. And I'm True. Yeah. super stoked to be here and, and to meet you and to get to know you better as well. Um, and uh, I mean, all of my amazing photography friends came from Instagram. Um, and I, I also like to say that just because something was some way for a while doesn't mean that we have to continue to like it when it changes. And I think that's a hard disconnect for people because like I really liked Instagram when it was new and it wasn't owned by Facebook and it exposed me to like lots of cool people and lots of cool things. Yeah. yeah. But it changed and I don't have to, I don't have to go with it. You know, if I sure. don't want to make reels, don't make reels. Right. If, if that's not of an interest to you, who cares if it doesn't, in, you know, increase your algorithmic engagement, 
Just right. don't do it if you don't want to do it. Yeah. And I refuse to make reels <laughs> and, and I just want to share photography and I'm okay with that. Do it yeah. on your own terms. I think that's the big thing that I'm trying to say is just do it on your own terms and forget about, you know, all the pressures that we put on ourselves with it. Yeah. And I think that curation piece is important and also like how you engage with people. Um, and it's not to say that like if there's someone who has a different opinion than me or they have different type of photography that I'm not totally into it doesn't mean I'm not going to follow them or engage with them. But like if over the course of two years that I'm engaged with somebody, they've never engaged with me back and, um, they only, you know, like you can just tell when it's not really a reciprocal kind of a deal sometimes or whatever. And if, I don't know, like there's a photographer that I've been following for probably eight years and he's been following me for about the same amount of time. And I finally just unfollowed and blocked him the other day because every time I would engage with him, it was just super toxic and negative. And I was like, what, why am I doing this to myself? You know, it's like, just move on, get, totally. you know, just get rid of it. Well, and, and one of the other things we have to be careful of is not just the toxic negativity, but the toxic positivity. Because oh, for there's, sure. It's there's so, so many people who are it's trying. The same. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, they're only engaging with you to boost their own algorithmic engagement. I know. And it's, oh, I just. <laughs> it, I know. Like my so, least, my, not to go on this rant much longer, but my absolute least favorite posts on Twitter are the ones when people say like, show me all of your black and white photos or yeah. like post your sunrises and sunsets. I'm retweeting all. And you look at their, they have like a hundred thousand followers or something. And you're just like, why? Like all you're doing is just telling people to like, you're praying. You're, it's almost like you're the, the guy in the white panel van with candy in his van and you're out of middle school <laughs> and you're like, Hey, if you come over to my van, I'll give you some candy. Like that's what those people sound like to me. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I totally get that. I mean, they, the, you know, on Twitter, they're basically the, the hub of the Instagram, you know, where just like, right. we're just going to, you know, engage, boost our own thing on your dime without giving you anything for it. Yeah, it's super annoying and like so obvious too. And like, I'm so always surprised at how it's, many people comment. It's so obvious. And I'm not going to lie. I've done it a few times, you know, like I think right, it, like, Oh yeah, here's a cool picture of that scene right. or whatever. Yeah. But you know, and, and <laughs> you know, granted that was when I was new to Twitter and I was trying to like, you know, yeah. just see how it worked and, and everything like right. that. And I think after about three or four months on Twitter and I had a brief dalliance into the NFT thing, which is why I really wish I hadn't, had, <laughs> hadn't had done, but it was a good learning opportunity. Um, you know, of what I didn't want to do with my life and my photography. No, no. Um, but I think after, you know, experiencing that, I just, you know, it was a, a hard example of what I didn't want to do. And now I'm only pretty much try to be on Twitter just for weather, weather stuff. <laughs> that's, that's cool. I mean, I, it's all in how you use it, right? Like I still have really positive fun engagements with other photographers in there, but yeah, I don't participate in the nonsense. It's just no. annoys me. I, I found though that like even just the way that their their set their setup is is like I'll post something and like, you know, I've got a, a close to a thousand followers in there, but I won't even get one like on on my post. And I'm like, why am I wasting my time with this? You know, like Right. Like, yeah, no, I feel that. If I want to engage with people positively, I'm gonna engage with people positively in the ways that I've created, be that, you know, my my own audience through whatever social media or my friends or the conference or whatever right so yeah well i speaking of your conference we're going to get to that soon but i wanted to ask you a couple more kind of unrelated questions first um just to you know satiate my own curiosity um mm -hmm. so what's it like bringing your dog with you on all of your photography trips um it's kind of the best <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I had, um, for the, for the better part of the last 12 years, I've had two dogs <clears throat> and, uh, my other dog, Nisa passed away in August of 2020. So, you know, right, right in the middle of COVID, the... um, which was actually, you know, wasn't a bad thing because I had had four months of lockdown where I got to spend those last four months every day with her. Right. And yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
Nisa wasn't a big adventure dog. She would rather be inside and, and whatever else. Um, so since she's passed, Quinn and I, Quinn's my other dog, we just go on adventures all the time. And she loves being outside. She loves road trips. She loves all of it. Um, and it's just nice to have a road buddy. You know, quite often when we're doing our photography trips, we're going out by ourselves all the time, right? And mm -hmm. it can get a little lonely. Um, so having the dog with me all the time, you know, keeps it interesting. Um, and, you know, there's lots of times when we're, not, when we're not shooting, but we're just going for great hikes and scouting and she's getting outside and having, you know, uh, a, an amazing time. And, and, and now she's 13 and a half. Um, so I kind of feel like we're on borrowed time. You know, that's that's old for a dog. And yep. so if I can, you know, just keep us going out and, and having those adventures together, it's just, you know, means that the, her last days are going to be super fulfilled um, and doing things that she loves, too, instead of just, you know, hanging around the living room all the time. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that to some degree it can kind of dictate what you do or don't do in the field as well? Absolutely, it does. Um, you know, she's got her own bed in the back of the Jeep and everything's all set up. So like if it's a, if I'm going to a, you know, walking down somewhere for sunset where I know she might get into some trouble or wander off or whatever, she'll just stay in the Jeep when gotcha. I need to like yep. focus on photography. Um, but other times, you know, she's out there right, right there beside me snoozing in the dirt or whatever. And, um, you know, I've, I've come to discover that you know, the U.S. national parks don't allow dogs a whole lot um, in a lot of ways. <clears throat> so, you know, if I do go on a road trip this year, which is something that I'm, I'm looking to do, I'm going to have to, you know, not go to the spots that I would normally maybe want to go just because they're not super dog friendly. Um, but that'll just take me off a beaten path to somewhere else. It's going to be really cool that I might not have discovered. So exactly. It's yeah, not yeah. limiting or anything, you know. She's she's perfectly content to be in the Jeep for three hours in the middle of the night while I'm, you know, shooting in the Milky Way over hoodoos and waiting for things to get in the right spot. She just gets annoyed when I come in. She's like, hey, I'm sleeping here. Come on. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, she takes up the whole bed. I've got, a you know, the back of the Jeep converted with a bed and everything like that. And I try to get in there and I'm like trying to squeeze in the sleeping <laughs> bag. And she's like, um, no. <laughs> right. It's but at least it's, it may, she makes it warm for you, though. She does. If I can get in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, Shane. Well, let's get to the kind of the second main part of the podcast here. You know, one of the most exciting reasons I wanted to talk to you was because you've created um, the Light Chasers Nature Photography Conference in Canada. And I would love for you to tell us what it is and why you decided to create it. Yeah. Um, so, it's basically exactly what it is. It's the Light Chasers Nature Photography Conference. And it's a conference that's dedicated solely to the discussion um, and, and passion and um, you know, exploration of nature photography in all of its facets. Um, there's so many photography conferences that are just general photography things. So you might have a wildlife photographer talking with, you know, a studio portrait photographer talking with a street photographer. And while that's certainly interesting, it might not you know, say the, you know, the need of the person who's going there specifically for the street photography or the nature photography or whatever. Um, it's a three day event. Um, we held our first one in May of 2022 and I had no idea how it was going to go over. Um, I, d I still distinctly remember the day that I, that I launched the ticket sales, like my armpits would not stop leaking. <laughs> I wanted to throw up all day. I was like, oh God, I'm just like this big nervous ball of anxious grossness. Um, and, you know, as, and, and, you know, it, I had the general concept, but it wasn't, you know, we were still months away and just like figuring it out as we went. And as it, all the pieces started coming in together, I'm like, man, this is, this is great. You know, and we signed Fujifilm as our title sponsor and, you know, a couple of the local amazing retailers, McBain and the camera store came on board. Case Filters came on board as a co-sponsor. Um, and, and all of these things just started falling into place and we sold the 125 tickets for it. We brought in some of the biggest names in, in Canadian nature photography. Adam Gibbs was our key, keynote speaker, Victoria Hack, Mark Jinks, Joe Desjardins, Curtis Jones, um, and, and more. And, and we covered, you know, a wide breadth of topics. You know, Monica Devia gave an amazing night sky. Uh, oh, I love Monica. 
yeah, you know, she's a really good friend. So, you know, it was like, it, it was really cool because I got to just bring all of my good friends to this conference to have them talk and all of us hang out and yeah, you know, meet awesome. all these other people. And, yeah. and I, that, that organic grassroots nature of it, I think really resonated with our audience too, because people were just like, this was, you know, we heard, you know, the, the feedback was like, it was one of the most amazing conferences or workshops or anything that people had ever attended. And um, so, you know, and, and we covered, you know, Beth Allen gave an amazing storm chasing presentation and, and all of this stuff. And it was, it was just fantastic, you know, um, how it all came together. And I, and I learned a ton about what to do next um, for the next one. So as we were, you know, we're coming into May 26th to 28th this year, it's going to be three full days. Um, we've got really big sponsors on board this year. I haven't announced them yet, so I can't quite say who they are. Um, and, you know, we launched tickets December 1st, um, which was earlier because I kind of wanted to take advantage of, of Christmas and things like that. But we're, you know, this is where we started. Last week was the week that we made our first announcements last year. As of right now, there's only 25 tickets left. Um, for the oh, wow. Thing. Like it's it's sold incredibly fast. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we just sort of built it around the, uh, the concepts of exploration uh, community and education. Uh, it's held in Pincher Creek, which is a very, very small town in Southern Alberta that doesn't get a lot of traffic and a lot of tourism outside of the main summer months. Um, but it's, it's, uh, right next to Waterton National Park, which is, uh, one of the, the main national parks in Alberta. Uh, and it's right outside Castle, uh, Provincial Park. So there's all this incredible area to explore. And not only that, it's literally right where the prairies crash into the mountains. So if you go oh, cool. east, you're right in flat prairies. And if you go west, you're right in south where you're right in the mountains. So it's this incredible area that's kind of underexplored. And and I did that by design, too, because, you know, Banff and Jasper are just so overplayed. They're beautiful and they're overplayed for a reason. But, you know, sure. small towns is where the tourism dollars need to go, not to those places. Right. 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 Um, you know, as for, for why I started it, um, it goes back to a lot of the stuff we've sort of been discussing already. You know, um, I'd seen some of these other conferences in the States. You know, there, there's, a, there's a couple of other ones that, that, that happen. And I was like, man, those would be really great to go to and it'd be really cool to have something like that in Canada. And I just kind of got thinking, you know, like as somebody who's been organizing events for 20 years and conferences and conventions, Maybe I should be the guy to try to do that. And instead of it being like, oh man, I had that idea like 10 years ago and I never did it. I think, you know, COVID gave me the opportunity to, to start laying the foundations and to, to build it up. Um, you know, and, and I just wanted to create an opportunity for people to get off social media, for people to engage authentically with one another um, in, a, in a way that is affordable uh, in a way that allows them to, you know, uh, interact with their favorite photographers and their favorite brands um, in ways that aren't just like we're in a trade show hall and, you know, uh -huh. you know, like when Fujifilm came, they brought 25 GFX 100s and let people sign them out and take them out and try them for the weekend, right? Like right. that's the sort of experience that we're, we're cultivating with this event. We've got field workshops, we've got portfolio reviews, we've got photo contests, we've got all of these things that, you know, help engage people in with, you know, not just the people that they like, but with themselves and, you know, to, to examine their own work, examine how they, you know, they shoot, what they do, what, what they're interested in, introduce new concepts to them that they maybe never even thought were things that you could explore and photograph. Right. So, right. Right. Um, and, and really to build community. Uh, that's one of the big things that I've always been a, a, a huge proponent of in what I do with the toy and comic book shows yeah. is building community and to, to build it off our phones. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of our co-founders for Natural Landscape Photography Awards, uh, Rajesh, he's been trying to convince us to, to do a NLPA conference type thing. And I remember all three, all the, the other three of us were like, dude, do you have any idea what goes into doing a conference? <laughs> so I, I want you to tell us like how, what exactly goes into organizing a conference? Because I think it's a massive 
thing to take on. It is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like last year I was working 14, 16 hour days from home, like on it nonstop. I'd get up at seven in the morning and I'd by like nine o'clock, I was like, okay, I can, I can take a break. It, it is a huge undertaking. Um, you know, I, I don't even know really exactly how to answer that question because it is so big. But right. also because <laughs> I've been doing events for so long that it is sort of second nature to me. Right. That for me, it feels easy because, like, to be perfectly honest, this is much easier than putting on a big comic book convention. Much easier. Photographers are way easier to deal with <laughs> than trying to bring celebrity guests and comic book creators and, you know, cosplayers and all these people to, to, to Edmonton. Whereas like trying to convince a, a photographer who's, you know, like we were talking about earlier, just trying to make it as a, as a pro and you offer them some money to come to a cool, really cool place to, to do photography for a weekend, they're in. Like, right, like, right, 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 right. Why, yeah, why yeah, wouldn't yeah. I go do that? Yeah. Right? But like trying to get like David Tennant from Doctor Who to come to Edmonton, it's like, It's okay. like, come on. <laughs> right? So... But, you know, there's so many logistics that I, that people just, I think, unless you've been putting on events that you wouldn't even begin to to understand, like, all of the things that go into it. It's not know, it's like, about, like, renting a room and inviting some people. You know, there's there's so many. There's scheduling. There's making sure that everything interacts well with one another and putting right. speakers in an order that's going to flow well. There's right. lining up your brand partners. There's lining up community partners. There's making sure that the restaurants in town know you're coming and that you're, right. you're working with, you know, different different operators of hotels. And, like, it's there's a lot. Yeah, I remember when I was in college, I was really involved in the residence hall association. I, I lived on I lived on campus all four years. I'm, a, I'm one of those nerds, but I was an RA for three years. So, but I remember my second year of college, um, we we were going to host a regional conference, and me and this other guy got put in charge of putting it on. And like I just remember, it was way more than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you yeah. know. It's a lot, you know, and I see people in town do it all the time. They're like, I'm going to put on a toy and comic book show. Okay. Go for it. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> see how you like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I'm guessing for you, I mean, not to get into the nitty gritty there, but I'm guessing this is kind of one of those dreams for the river, yeah? It is, yeah. And it's and yeah. it's turned out to be a really good one, you know. Um, it, I, I, I struggled for a long time with, like, how to – make photography a business because at a certain point you do get there whether you want to you like I was probably dragged kicking and screaming and it's like <laughs> you know well I could try to do workshops and I could hustle all of this stuff but man like all of my friends who I love are already struggling with their workshops and if now I'm doing it I'm cutting into their yeah, potential yeah. income and I didn't necessarily need to do that so it was a way for me to um you know, it, it's my events business. It's part of my events business, but it's a way for me to be a, to put on a passionate event about something that I love in a way that can help my friends because I get to pay my friends to be there and to speak and to talk and to maybe, you know, introduce other people to their work and, and their workshops and things. Um, and it's a way for all of us to make money, you know, together. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that the one of the coolest parts about it? I mean, so like for NLPA, one of the coolest parts for me is like I get to pay people that I know to be judges like so I'm helping them hopefully and then I also get to give out you know almost twenty thousand dollars worth of money to well-deserving photographers for their really cool photographs and that that feels great you know yeah. and then also like I get to put them in a really nice book and like feature their work. So I mean, it, it is, it's, it's not just, it's not about money for me. Like it's, but that's, it's nice. If you get money, we for haven't, sure. I mean, we haven't like made money yet, but that would be nice, but that's not why we're doing it. And I'm guessing for you, it's probably the same. It's, you know, making when, money is cool, but also it's awesome to be able to help all these people and have absolutely. this experience. And when I launched it last year, I fully intended to lose money the first year. I right. knew yeah, that yeah, the, yeah. the proof of concept was there, but I fully intended that, you know, I'm probably going to lose some money. I didn't. I made some yeah, good nice. money and I was able to tweak it in a way that allows me to make better money this time. But right. it's, it's, it's not about the money per se. And I think with what you guys do and with, with what I'm trying to do with this is, you know, 
to tie back in with what we were talking about earlier, there are ways to organically and authentically um, use photography as a means to make money without it being this constant like in your face sort of a thing, right? right? There are ways outside of just like buy my prints, attend my workshop, buy my NFTs that we can enrich the community and provide something that's uh, of benefit to everyone that still helps us out financially too, right? And, right. and for me, it's that community enrichment. And I'm sure that it is for you guys as well. You're creating something that is of great benefit and need to the community. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do too. And, and I'm, I'm doing it in a way that I'm trying to keep it, you know, affordable for everybody. One of the right. things about photography is there's a massive barrier to, to entry and there's a massive barrier to access. And there are some other, you know, uh, events and conferences in the States that I think are wonderful, but they're like, yeah, you know, come hang out with your favorite photography professionals for the weekend, blah, 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 for $5,000. Right. Yeah. Four thousand dollars or seven thousand dollars or whatever. Yeah. And I'm sure you're getting a really great experience, but who can afford that? Right? right. There's so many photographers who are passionate about it who don't have that kind of money. Right. And you know, my early bird ticket for this conference, which is three days, thirteen renowned speakers, you know, our Saturday last year was nineteen hours of programming. My early bird ticket is three hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, totally reasonable. Right. And, and people can come and they can have a weekend out and it's like, yeah, could I make more money? Absolutely. Do I need to? Absolutely not. I want people to be able to, exp I want people who can't go to those things in the States or to attend these big, crazy $10,000 workshops in, in wherever to be yeah. able to attend something that is equally as beneficial, fun and exciting for them. Right. So what do you what do you what are your hopes and dreams for what the conference accomplishes in the future? Continuing to to break down you know those barriers, um, I, I want people to be able to interact with their favorite photographers um, in in great ways. You know, one of the things that I loved about last year is that all of the presenters stayed and watched all of the presentations in the room, and they were there hanging out with people. Um, we have it, you know, that our presenters are out at our field sessions and then we're not leading workshops at the field sessions. The presenters are just out there hanging out and they can chat and answer questions and maybe give ideas and things like that. But it's not like a, we've brought a model to this location to shoot this exact thing for everyone. Right. It's not formulaic. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd like to be able to maybe do some smaller niche events again that are like, you know, affordable, but you know, maybe a little more hands-on, a little more workshoppy. I'm looking, like I've already built a 10 year plan for the conference. Oh, wow. um, I'd like, you know, every other year to do two a year. I want to keep our flagship location, but you know, bring it to other parts of the country. Canada is a vast country. Right. Um, we have amazing locations and, you know, to give people an, an opportunity to go to some, some places they maybe wouldn't necessarily go to or people in those locations to bring a world-class event to them that they wouldn't necessarily be able to attend otherwise. Um, you know, I want to continue to elevate Canadian photographers. Um, there's so many amazing Canadian photographers who aren't part of like the cool club who are on all of the, you know, you know, the podcasts or talk about all the different things and, you know, are, are, are invited to all the, the, the other kinds of conferences and events. So I want to continue to elevate Canadian photographers, um, you know, put them on a world stage. We're going to bring in keynote speakers from all around, but then they're exposed to what we're doing here. Um, I want to give voices to people who don't normally have voices at this kind of things, you know, whether it's, you know, BIPOC or indigenous people, or, you know, I've, I've got a girl speaking at this one who's 18. She's an 18 year old award winning, um, wildlife photographer. How often do you get to hear the perspective of an 18 year old at a conference? Right. And those are voices. One of the, one, one of the, uh, our participants last year emailed me right off the conference and she's like, I'm a 24 year old girl and I never see myself represented at these things. Mm. And at this conference I did. And I just wanted to thank you for that. So like we nice. have like, it's a, it's important for me for our speakers to be a minimum 50, 50 men and women, because we need to elevate all of the amazing women photographers out there in the world. Um, and you know, to, you know, we've got, I've got a guy who, 
was born in Africa, educated in London, moved to China and, and discovered macro photography in China. And now we moved to Edmonton and he's this amazing <laughs> macro photographer. It's like, let's elevate voices like that. He's not right. incredibly well known, but he's makes beautiful art, right? So to continue like that sort of thing, to kind of break down the barriers of like photography is just for old white dudes, uh, rich old white dudes, <laughs> um, you know, to, to you know, and just create an event that's like, you know, feels authentic and embodies a lot of the stuff like you guys do with the Natural Landscape Photography Awards, you know, like it's just, it feels more honest and authentic and to just to keep that moving forward, right? And to give people an, uh, an experience that's, you know, worth remembering. I love it. Um, so given like just how much there is to put on a, something like this, I'm curious, like, have you, do you have people helping you? Like, like, or are you doing it all by yourself? I'm doing it all by myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I could have people work with me, um, but I've just learned the hard way in business um, that having partners sometimes never doesn't work out. It, it, it's, it makes it, it can be good and bad. We'll just absolutely, say absolutely. Um, <laughs> I've just had bad enough experiences that um, I don't need to do that anymore and this way if you know if there's anyone to blame for anything going wrong with this there's only one person to look at and it's me and i take all responsibility um yeah. and for me that's just a lot easier than to be like man you dropped the ball on that and, and creating conflict or whatever else and i'm stoked for people like you know i hope that you guys with everyone that you have involved in your thing it, it works and it's smooth and it's awesome and i hope it continues that way forever um you know, and maybe it's just the, the types of businesses that I've been in, you know, like the tattoo industries, you know, can be a little backbitey sometimes. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the toy and comic book business can be pretty bad sometimes. Um, so just from those experiences with this one, this one's all me. Um, well, you know, people I, are people. <laughs> people are people. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, I have some folks helping me out the weekend of. Um, but even last year, you know, like a, a, my good friend, who's an, another event organizer, she was going to come and be on site and help me with everything. She got sick just oh, before no. she couldn't make it. So my poor girlfriend literally got thrown to the wolves and had to like do everything else that I couldn't do. And she's not a photographer. <laughs> she's like, this is a whole, you know, you know, whole new world world for her. And she, she did it and she handled it and it was, it was awesome. But, um, yeah, I'll have some, some help the weekend of, but in the planning, it's all me. All right, I have um, one more question until the last question. Um, so you said you have like Fuji and stuff like that. Like, what was your, what was your approach with engaging brand sponsors to get them to help sponsor your event? Because we're we're struggling big time with uh, that with the NLPA, and I'm not, I haven't like figured it out. I mean, it's like. We have a pretty large mailing list. Like we're gonna promote you and who you are to a large audience of your target demographic. Like, I don't know what I'm like if I'm saying the wrong things. Like, what is your approach? <sighs> Five seconds, <laughs> three point, hail mary. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that too, <clears throat> man. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. We had a lot. I, I had a lot of. Um, ignored messages, straight up ignored outright um, from tons of brands that um, I would have thought would have been a shoe in for exactly the same reason that you you said. And I think you guys would be even more of a shoe in just because of, like you said, there's so many people engaged with us. Like our audience is, you know, we can fit 160 people in the room. Right. Um, but that's, you know, that's a good size number of people but it's it's that they're they're, they're a, a core audience and they're there and they want to interact with you and you know i kept my sponsorship levels affordable um you know i didn't want them to be like this is a twenty thousand dollar title sponsorship for an event that you know hasn't happened yet and from somebody that they've never heard of before so i knew i needed to keep those prices reasonable um i needed needed to keep my asks reasonable I knew I needed to create a really diverse uh, pool of opportunities for their for them to engage. 
Um, so, you know, my sponsorship package was, you know, very in depth. It explained what we were all about and then it explained, you know, all the different kinds of things that we would offer them specifically that they could have access to. Uh, and then we gave them the opportunities of like, here's the $5,000 level. Here's a $3,000 level. Here's a $1,500 level. Here's a thousand dollar level. Here's a $500 level. And so it, it gave, it gave them options. Um, and it, it's, it, it's embracing the ones who do want to work with you. Um, and, and just cultivating those relationships and just kind of being like, you know what, if we've tried year one, year two, year three to reach out to you know, X brand and we're constantly ignored by them, then forget it. They're the ones who lose out. That's the way that I look at it. And, you know, there's one major brand who didn't sign on this year. And I'm like, really? Like you, all of your competitors are there and you're not going to do that. That's your loss. It makes mm. you look bad, not me, right? So I'm just going to continue to cultivate the relationships with the ones who do want to work with me instead sure. of trying to, you know, figure out ways to get other people to, you know, force yeah. them to pay attention to what I'm doing. You know, like yeah. I, I had people who were like sponsored and ambassadors for certain brands reach out to the brand and be like, hey, I'm going to be a part of this. This is going to be great. You should, and just crickets, like ignored. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Cause I've also tried to do that, leverage some of that too. And it's, has yeah, got, I mean, I, I've, some of it I think is the economy, like, you know, like I think a lot of the camera brands and things like that are super nervous and they're probably seeing a hit to their sales, but I mean, realistically, what does it cost them to donate a camera or something like that? It's for yeah, sure. It's interesting. You know, and, and on the flip side too, though, like yeah, a lot of them have taken hit, but what has been one of the most explosive hobbies that have come from the pandemic? I know. Photography, right? You've got so many people who are picking up cameras for the first time that this is an amazing opportunity for them to come interact with your brand. Um, I think, you know, for, for what I'm doing versus what we're, what you're doing is like, we have that hands-on component. Yeah. That probably helps a lot. You know, which, which makes, you know, people can come and ask questions and touch and try right? Touch and try is huge. That makes a lot of sense. But, you know, getting, I don't understand why a brand wouldn't want to be associated with what you guys are doing or. Yeah. Maybe we just need to be more creative about our pitch, you know, like, Hey, we'll let you do a demonstration of your product. I don't know, something. I don't know. Well, and, and that's it. You know, like I've got, you know, opportunities for them to be presenters. Um, right. I, I've, I've, this year I created a new level where they can bring one of their ambassadors as our presenter, as one of our presenters. So then, you know, they're there, they've got a booth and they've got one of their ambassadors talking there. Who's just talking up their brand. Right. Like, right. and that's a pretty affordable option for them. And yeah, a lot of them are right. jumping on that. And so, they're giving their ambassador an opportunity. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. But man, man, like sponsorships is one of the hardest things, you know, in, in 20 years yes. of putting on toy and comic book shows, like that was a huge grind and like, who do we work with? How do we get people on board? You know, like, I know it's tough. It is hard. Well, I'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> well, I'll keep, I'll keep, you know, with all the connections that I'm making, I'll tell them to look at what you guys are doing and see if we can get them to come, come play ball. We'll, we'll tag team light chasers with NLPA. And... I like it. I like it. All right. Well, Shane, last question. Um, who do you recommend for the podcast? I'm going to just stick with Canadian photographers. Um, there's so many amazing Canadians who I think would, you know, have, have a lot to say. Um, Victoria Hack is, uh, you know, amazing. She's one of my favorite people, one of my favorite photographers. She's great. Um, she should be a guest here soon. And just yesterday, she confirmed she's going to be one of our judges for NLPA. Awesome. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah. 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 Victoria's amazing. She's going to be, um, you know, a really wonderful guest for you. I can't wait to hear you guys, hear you guys chat. Um, Mark Jinks, um, is an absolutely incredible Canadian photographer. Um, you know, he's, he's been a huge inspiration for me. Him and I are like super close. We go on adventures all the time. Um, and, uh, it, it was, you know, it was his kindness and his openness 
you know, I just started like messaging him on Instagram when I started and I was like, Hey man, you're from the same town as I am. We should like hang out and do something. He's like, okay. And it was great, you know, and we just, and I wish more photographers were like that. Um, but Mark's wonderful. Um, Dave Broshaw, who's, you know, one of Canada's most famous photographers, uh, across so many genres. Yeah. That he, I associate him with Paul Ziska. Is that? Yeah. So him okay. and Paul have the offbeat collective where you know, right, okay. they, they do tours all around the world. They do workshops all across Canada. They've got really great groups to interact with and stuff. So yeah. Um, Dave's, Dave's amazing. Curtis Jones. Um, he's really good friends with Dave Broshaw, but you know, he's an incredible photographer. Nat Gillis, her work, you know, in the, in the Arctic and the Antarctic, incredible stuff. Uh, Jason Petit, Richard Martin. Um, yeah, there's just Monica Deviate for a great night photographer. There's, there's so many yeah. great people, you know, that I'm just going to list off the light chasers, you know, all of our presenters <laughs> from light chasers. You could just, you know, go with them. Uh, hey, man. I mean, I recognized most of those names, so that's good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're we've we've got some really great people up here. There's, you know, I find too like there's sort of a Canadian style that maybe doesn't get talked about enough to you. You know, like what do you do when you're just out in the prairies, the barren prairies? Like prairie photography is its own style, but because it's not mud cracks and <laughs> whatever else, it doesn't it doesn't get the 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 love that it should. Yeah, I'm I'm a really big fan of Jason's work and Richard as well. I've, actually written an on landscape article about Victoria's work, Jason's work and Richard's work. So very familiar with them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's great. You know, I, I appreciate it so much because like as a, as a nature photography generalist, I'm, I'm interested in so many different kinds of nature photography and, yeah, that's cool. you know, so I, I want to see, you know, all of these people who do different things that, you know, maybe, you know, like storm chasing photography doesn't necessarily get as mentioned as much in the in the in the, you know, the, the natural landscape photography world. You don't see storm shots in, in any of the contests. And very few. Yeah. Very few. Right. And, you know, it's for me, you know, it's the, probably the thing that I love right now the 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 aspect of nature photography that i love the most um because you know we're you don't know what you're going to get you don't yeah. know if your day is going to be a bust you don't know if you're going to have to drive a thousand kilometers from home you don't know if it's going to happen at home you don't know if you're going to get a supercell or a shelf cloud or a tornado you don't know if it's going to happen over an abandoned location that you've had a pin for and you've been waiting for for you know years to get that storm shot you don't right. know what's going to happen versus like I can pretty much know what this spot's going to look like if the color pops over this lake and this mountain. Right. You know, so it is very, just, very, very ephemeral. Yeah. And it's, and and it's, yeah. I, my only thing is like, man, that's a long time to spend in the car. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I, I get asked all the time from people like, you know, what's storm chasing like? I'm like, oh, it's about 10 hours of sitting around for an hour of excitement. <laughs> right. Like, imagine being a truck driver. And you have a camera too. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, you know, once it kicks off, you're like one part indie driver, one part cartographer, one part social media expert, one part right. weatherman, right, and right, you right. have to be an expert photographer to get up and set up three cameras and time lapses and everything all in focus yeah, yeah. at the same time <laughs> before you get ran over, you know, like it's, right. it's, there's a lot to it. Yeah. Well, Shane, this has been awesome. Yeah. I've had a great time, man. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you, Shane, for the amazing conversation. If you enjoyed our chat, you can catch a bonus episode on Patreon where Shane and I share our secrets for how we manage our time as two people who have a lot of plates spinning. If that sounds helpful to you, please head over to patreon.com forward slash f-stop and listen. Shane wanted, to, wanted me to mention his amazing guest speakers for the Light Chasers Conference this year. Their keynote speaker will be Alistair Ben, followed up by an all-star cast including Rebecca Simrose, Alan Dyer, Dara Oho, Anna Morgan, Alex Busey, Abby Raylander, Victoria Hack, and many more. If the conference sounds awesome to you, you can learn more at lightchasersconference.com. 
Speaking of awesome, I have to take a moment to thank our incredible supporters on Patreon. There is a list of people that we like to call our podcast producers, and they've earned this title by supporting the show at $20 per month. The list is long, but I wanted to point out a few people that have been supporting the show for a very long time, including Joshua Wallace, Eric Stensland, Suzanne Mathia, Michael Rung, Drew Armstrong, John Whitaker, Frank Otto Peterson, William Nurse, Dan Hawk, Gary Randall, Anton Everin, and many, many more. I love you all for your support. I really don't even know how to thank you except for to say thank you. <laughs> well, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.